So, I'm Monica Emmerich, and I'm here to introduce Nabil today, but um, I, <laughs> I wanted to say in the interest of our conversation here, I have sort of, I did my doctorate in, uh, at the University of Colorado at the center where Nabil is associate director at the Center for Media, Religion, and Culture, and I think I've gone over to the dark side. Uh, so I teach online at online universities where we're having a very different kind of conversation where they fully embrace the free market system and uh, have gone all out for a for-profit. And uh, the system has, as I've told Nabil and, and Lynn, the system has a long way to go to evolve. Um, I, I like to think that maybe I'm making some bit of difference in the students' lives, but I neither see my students, uh, I don't often speak to my students. Most everything is, is digital via email. Um, we have occasional webinars, but the system has, if you look at the success of online universities and CSU Global Campus, uh, for instance, in our own backyard, is making more profit than <laughs> probably anyone has a right to, but the, the profit system that they've developed has become one of sort of Fordism. Mm -hmm. um, they've taken apart the educational system so that I don't have any control over my lectures. Uh, it's, it's an assembly line. We have people who are hired, let's say we'll hire Lynn to write some content about um, business administration or, or coaching, let's say. She would give that, pro that product to somebody called an instructional designer who then takes it and sort of manipulates it and thinks, how can we make this a teachable moment for our students? And then it goes through a couple of other people and finally it comes to me, the instructor. So I have no input into the lecture. I never have met Lynn. I never have met any of the people up the assembly line. Uh, for my product. Mm -hmm. What I'm allowed to do is to, I can go on to the discussion board with my students, and the students are, are graded on their discussion. They have to participate every day. Um, it's the online university's way of forcing them to, sure. to sort of interact with each other. But it's a very odd system. I mean, I, I, they're making money, they're for profit, they say, we're, you know, we're getting rid of all of those courses like theory and critical thinking and all of those things, and they're very focused on skills. So part of what we'll be talking about today yeah. is, is um, how does the modern university compete or in a free market system and, and still become a space for reflective processes mm -hmm. on society's deepest questions and oldest questions. Do we still do that? Or are we really just yeah. about producing technological skills that um, produce workers for a, a marketplace that we then, as a university, mm -hmm. have to uh, address? It, it's a tricky question. And yeah, now so. that I sit on the other side of this in a space that has very much said, we're not reflecting anymore. We're all about teaching skills. Um, it's a it's a curious yeah. place yeah. to be. So would it be too simplistic to say that the uh, the heart is going out of the system? You know, I I think for younger uh, professors or instructors, it, it always amuses me that they call us professors because to me that we've been stripped of so much of what makes us a professor. But <laughs> they call us professors. I call us instructors. I think younger instructors would say, no, this is this is right where it's yeah. at because this is how they learned and a lot of the PhDs that are going into online university teaching receive their PhDs in online universities. Mm -hmm. So it is a, it's a self-fulfilling um, system. And I, there are advantages before I go too far down that track and cut into Nabil's time, but oh, that's fine. Um, there are advantages. In, in theory, I like the idea of an online university. There, I look at my students. I have soldiers. Um, I have single moms trying really hard to get an MBA uh, at night. Um, I have disabled students. Uh, it, there are advantages to having an online university that's accessible 24-7. And, and meets people where they are in their place. That's the advantage. The disadvantage is that I'm very concerned about <clears throat> the content 
and the ability for people to engage such as we're engaging. And the way that we do that in online universities, I feel, is very superficial. Mm -hmm. um, we force them into these digital spaces and, and call them a classroom. But How much personal contact is there at all? Excuse me. I'm None. sorry. We have a speaker. <laughs> we we are going to address some of these questions. I think Monica here set us on a really good path. And so, with that, um, <laughs> let me introduce our speaker today, Nabil Ashaibi. I and I've been pronou it, mispronouncing your fine. name for years. No worries. Now. Uh, Nabil is the associate director for the Center for Media, Religion, and Culture at the university, and also a professor of media studies. And Nabil's uh, research usually looks at the relationship between media and the formation of Muslim identities. And today he's going to look at a little bit different puzzle about identity, looking at how in the institution of higher learning uh, exists in the free market system. Um, are we a reflective space? Are we technological skills? Are we creating, are you responsible for creating a more critical thinking citizenry? We hope so. Mm -hmm. um, so today you're going to solve all these problems for us. Yes, I'll know? try. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Monica, and thank you for um, the, the Boulder City Club, the Highland Boulder City Club, for in, uh, inviting me um, to just uh, share with you some of my thoughts about what has been uh, really just um, disturbing me for a few years. Um, and I'm not the only one, I think, anyone in academia today who has um, a, a passion for what they do, uh, who has an interest in their students, in the future of uh, this society and beyond in the world, actually share some of these concerns. Um, what I, I and many others have been calling the steady march of a neoliberal logic into the very heart of uh, the university, particularly the public university. I think uh, there are other issues to raise at the uh, level of the private university, um, but I see the public university as being really at the, um, the receiving end of a vicious attack, basically, uh, um, on its ideals, on its mission. Um, and uh, as students, as faculty, as staff, as concerned citizens, we have to do something about it. Otherwise, the heart, as Harvey said, the heart is going to actually go out of the system uh, pretty soon. Um, uh, I, I uh, put together a presentation. Um, some of it is depressing. Uh, some of it is also very uplifting. Um, I brought with me an example of ways in which we could actually start to recuperate some of that mission, some of those ideals of the public university, and to salvage it really from uh, the, um, uh, the grip of this neoliberal logic, which uh, has turned the university really into a knowledge factory as opposed to uh, more of a, a space uh, that um, encourages this kind of critical thinking and this preparation for the, the a democratic citizenry that can actually ask uh, good questions and can uh, sort through the issues and cannot be just governed but can actually question the governors as well. Uh, these are very important questions. I come from a field very uh, deeply steeped uh, in the humanities. Um, so the questions that I'm going to be raising today are questions about this kind of uh, theoretical preparation of our students who come to us with this incredible um, passion also for uh, different kinds of ideas, uh, but also for just the, the interaction itself in the classroom. And I think uh, some, something that we don't cherish anymore is that ability to have this this space like this where, where students can actually ask questions, both at the undergraduate level and the graduate level. Um, and if we meet that passion with cynicism, if we meet it with um, increasing um, repudiation of uh, theory and critical work, um, I think we're doing a major disservice to these students and we're doing a major disservice to the next generation of uh, citizens in this country and in the world at large, actually, uh, particularly in an age where, you know, we're dealing with some very um, disturbing, um, um, you know, events and, and, and leaders who are trying to take us in a, in a um, uh, I would say, risky uh, direction, uh, both politically, socially, and culturally. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to go to the podium and then uh, start this conversation. I like to say that probably it's about 40, 40 minutes or so. Please uh, stop me at any time if you want to uh, ask questions or uh, if you have a comment to make. Um, and then we'll open it up for uh, more questions as well. 
So, um, I'd like to um, start with a um, kind of a provocative statement about the state of public uh, university. And, um, and as I said earlier, maybe some of you uh, didn't hear me say this um, before, I'm originally from Morocco and I came to this country about 20 years ago as a young um, student, a graduate student, uh, just finished college in Morocco and came here to the United States um, really looking for a different kind of experience. I had great teachers, but it was a different kind of methodology and, and uh, pedagogy at the university there where, you know, the, the professor is the fountain of knowledge and you're not supposed to question their wisdom. And uh, you come here and it's a completely different um, um, uh, method, uh, methodology and, and pedagogy, a Socratic method really of learning. And I really found that very encouraging and I uh, was able to thrive and I'm forever grateful to my alma mater, uh, Indiana University, where I did my master's and my PhD in media studies. Um, and that really uh, was very influential in my intellectual uh, maturity, but also in my ability to ask very, very deep questions and, and make critical connections in the world. Um, and I, um, I, I, I think that that uh, aspect of education, I, th I think, is under attack, and this is why I have developed this, you know, this talk that I'm, I'm hoping to uh, uh, give and, and modify, and uh, at different kinds of venues to start uh, talking about this from my vantage point as someone who chairs a department in a new college that is trying to, uh, in a way, rethink. Uh, the study of media communication and information in the 21st century, particularly when we have students who come to us with um, so much, um, I think, uh, erudition in technology, and they think that they know it all, mm -hmm. and uh, we have to kind of slow it, slow them down, and tell them, okay, uh, there are some certain things that you still need to know, and it's not all about the tools and about technology. So the um, Here's the statement that I want to start with today. Uh, public universities are becoming dead zones of the social imagination, forced to think less in terms of the public good and more in terms of the instrumental logic of markets. Um, we've started already talking about this uh, just around lunch because I think I see uh, uh, almost a, a travesty, oops, my pointer is not working on the screen, it works right there, but uh, a travesty around the idea of public in the sense that uh, we really can't call our public universities public anymore uh, because of the way in which they are configured and the way in which they they um, receive so little money from the state. Um, and that money is really going down year, year after year. Um, so for me, this the idealism that I have about, uh, which is also rooted in, in realism, it's not just this kind of, you know, foo-foo type of idealism that doesn't have any, uh, um, you know, uh, grounding. But the idealism about the public uh, university, about the space, um, is critical to the future of the public university. And if we cannot reinvest in it, I think that we are going to end up with vocational schools, with knowledge factories, as I said before, and not with institutions of thinking, institutions that can actually produce thinkers. Uh, whether you're doing you know, your degree in chemistry or physics or you're doing your degree in history or in English or environmental studies. Uh, so I will be working from two premises today and, and share with you some of the people that have influenced me over the years. Um, here's a, a comparative literature, uh, late comparative literature professor, a very famous scholar, Edward Said out of Columbia University, um, and who, who was the kind of the, the typical public intellectual who never minced his words about how he wanted to talk about politics, about the issues that really bothered him at the time. He was very, very famous for a book that he published back in 1978 called Orientalism that exposed the Orientalist um, and imperialist, uh, basically, narratives around the Orient, and particularly around the Middle East, um, as the Middle East, as he said, was an idea, not a geographic location, because it was an idea lodged in the mind of the Westerner. Um, that created that idea in order to define who they are. But anyways, uh, the point where I'm mentioning here, because of something that he said about the public university, um, he, uh, he, he worked also at public universities, but not only there, but he said something very important. Uh, he said, the university is one of the few remaining utopian spaces in our society. 
Um, and some people criticized him. He said, well, it's not, uh, it shouldn't be that way. Uh, there are other spaces that could be considered that way. But he said that other spaces actually have been colonized by this market logic. And he, sa he saw the university as the place that still resisted that, that the classroom was this place that was not sponsored yet. Uh, it was, uh, although now some people can make the, the, you know, the argument that some of these classes are sponsored. But uh, for him, uh, the, sp the university as a utopian space was a place where we teach our students how to think, how to become socially responsible, um, how to question, interpret, and also confront authority. Uh, the university basically as a democratic public sphere. That's sort of what really uh, defined the, the, the advocacy for this space to be almost sacralized for him. Uh, he really thought of it that way. Yes? Is that concept real or a fiction? Um, well, what do you mean? When I was in graduate school, yeah. uh, and I, my doctoral committee wanted me to take out a passage that I wrote, mm -hmm. and I said, I objected, I said, isn't the university the place to explore openly uh, the truth and knowledge? Mm -hmm. They went into hysterical laughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think uh, it depends who you're talking to. I, I you know, uh, there, there is no uniform university experience. And in addition, yeah. my experience at the university uh, was that professors themselves uh, congregated in cliques and voiced ideas that they aligned with sure. and would viciously attack anybody. Absolutely. That, that, that's still there and has always been there. Right. It's part of the institution. And does that work for what you're saying or against it? Well, I think that uh, the, the idea of the, the utopia is to be able to arrive at some kind of semblance of a place where you're not going to go there to be ridiculed for the kind of ideas that you are holding. I will. Sure. Mm. But the thing is, that should not necessarily be the norm. And, but it is. But, but uh, well, it depends uh, who you're talking, you're, you're talking about. I think we, we uh, it's true that some academics and some intellectuals are very dead set in their ideologies. They don't want to uh, question their ideologies. But to me, it's how do you get to those ideas? How do you get to those conclusions? It's the method also that is very important. It's the critical method. If you are a method that wants to um, question my ideas, I, I feel that that method has been critical and has taken into account different kinds of ideas and different kinds of, of uh, trends and, and, and currents, intellectual currents. I'm fine with that. I should be fine with that. Now, I re reckon that not everyone is necessarily, but he was advocating for people who have that sensibility, and that's what the Open University should be. Um, Another uh, uh, author that I use a lot is the founder of the cultural studies, one of the founders of the cultural studies tradition in the UK, Stuart Hall, who uh, was also advocating for this kind of public intellectual um, and cultural studies as a project of practice as, oppo as opposed to just a project of theorizing. And he said this uh, back in the 80s, which was very, very um, uh, important, and a lot of academics took this to heart. Against the urgency of people dying in the streets, what in God's name is the point of cultural studies? At that point, I think anybody who is into cultural studies seriously as an intellectual practice must feel on their pulse its ephemerality, its insubstantiality, how little it registers, how little we've been able to change anything or get anybody to do anything. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel that as one tension in the work that you, do, that you are doing, theory has let you off the hook. I um, try to live by this, <laughs> and I think most academics have to live by this. Uh, how can we um, avoid our theorizing actually letting us off the hook? Uh, because we live in a world that actually is demanding, in an urgent way, our input. And we can no longer resign to our ivory towers. Uh, but we need to be enabled to do that. And what I'm going to share with you today is pretty much anxieties that are facing the, today's academic about how do we do exactly this? Because the, the university that these people actually operated in is different from the university we're operating in today.
right? And they warned us about some of these things, uh, that this, these things were impending. This uh, commercialization of academia was impending. And it is today. Uh, we are living it. And sometimes it doesn't really allow for this kind of political engagement or public engagement on the part of the, in, of the intellectual. So this space is basically, that's why I started with the, that provocation, is ender vicious attack. And we need to do something, both at the level of language. We need to use the force of language, but also use programs and uh, sensitize the public about how we can take back that language about the sanctity, if you want, of the public university. So for, for me, how do we safeguard the space of the public university so these things actually become possible and are, are also sustainable? Uh, people who come to you with passion like this and they want the university to help them beyond just teaching them how to handle a camera. Because we can do that and they could actually do this even on their own if they wanted to because there are all kinds of um, you know, kits today that you can just download online and you can do a decent job. But of course you can get some of that skill preparation also in our uh, new college because we've got the equipment and we've got the you know, Emmy Award winning filmmakers and whatnot. But it's, it's also a preparation, a critical preparation that has to happen in the classroom. So for me, it's, it's the primacy of the space itself that is under attack. So I want to talk about the, the anxieties facing uh, today's academic uh, who labors in constant fear of budget cuts, of dealing with less student enrollments, of relying on private grants to support their research, their creative work, of having to face an increasing commodification of their profession, of having to revise their curriculum uh, to meet market demands, and of facing a rampant culture of anti-intellectualism that thinks of professors as aloof, elitist, idealist, and condescending. And of course, some of them are, just like there are condescending doctors, and there are condescending lawyers, and there are aloof, um, you know, pretty much everyone. Um, I'd like also to talk about this, uh, pub the crisis of the public university at a time of excessive social acceleration, and I'll explain a little bit what I mean by that. But I also want to leave you today with a note of upbeat optimism mm -hmm. about how we can reclaim the primacy of public education and then reinvest in an uh, unwavering commitment to the social interest or the social imperative, as I call it. Um, so let's start with the crisis of the public university, and I've brought with me a few slides of, of some uh, numbers that are very sobering for all of us to consider. Um, what, is the, what is this uh, uh, crisis really like? Well, first of all, we have to talk about the conflation of uh, teach, teaching with training. This emphasis, heavy emphasis now on skills, on jobs, uh, technologies, and whatnot. You have students now who, uh, you know, since I've become chair, of course you are on the other side of the administration and then you re receive all kinds of um, requests from prospective students who are asking you, please share with me where your students, your graduates are getting jobs. Mm -hmm. How much money they are making. Do you have information? They want all of this kind of information. Uh, if, I, if I get an, a, a BA in media studies, uh, how much money will I get compared to a journalist or a journalism, um, you know, BA graduate? They want this kind of very, very uh, granular information that we are not supposed uh, to be giving to our students. That's not what the university is supposed to be about. But I can understand why they're doing that because, as we will see, they are facing also a very stern uh, economic situation and that's why they want to see if there is a return on their investment. Um, so. This is the logic of acceleration, which is also the logic of modernity. It's the logic of efficiency. It's the logic of um, outcomes, uh, measures, metrics, um, and a lot of faculty uh, know what you know metric systems are that actually evaluate how many articles they, they publish and where they publish them and how many books they publish and how many conference papers uh, they have presented and, and whatnot. Uh, this is becoming even more rigorous and more demanding on uh, faculty themselves and this is making a lot of faculty very nervous as well. So our t technologies are much faster and then they, they require of our lives to be faster um, by comparison and they demand also faster outputs. Right? You have to respond to emails. I get an average of about 80 to 90 emails a day. 
uh, about 70 of which I have to respond to. Uh, so you can imagine just the amount of uh, uh, just emailing back for anywhere from students to other faculty to other administration to uh, even parents who are concerned these days about what their kids got in, in a particular class and are, you know, they do that kind of helicopter parenting, which is a little bit uh, annoying. Um, and uh, our politics also are much more, um, you know, fast and much more accelerated and spectacular, but not necessarily democratic as we all know. So we used to talk about the knowledge society and today we're, we talk more about the knowledge economy. Um, things that we almost take for granted, right? The shift is not only about semantics, it's actually, it has tremendous implications for the way, the way in which we conceive of the social and how the university actually, public university, has to respond to that social imperative. Because that social is subjected every single day to the logic of economic interests and gains, and our notion of the public is also submitted to the tyranny of markets and profits, as I will show, and to the primacy of individual interest. Competition breeds individualism. I want to surge ahead. I want to forge ahead. How can I get that job? How can I get? How can I produce this? The next killer app. A lot of people come to the College of Information, Communication, uh, uh, Media Information, thinking that they're going to become the next Steve Jobs or the next, uh, you know, um, uh, app developer who's going to be making millions of dollars. Um, and and that's something that we want to dissuade them from because it's not about technology. It's about how can we think with technology to solve problems. And that's a, there is a huge distinction in, in, um, in, in between. In a 2014 survey of 10,000 middle um, and high school students conducted by Harvard University, only about 22% of respondents identify caring for others as one of their top priorities. 48% prioritize their own achievement and 30% their own happiness. The reason why I'm going to middle school and, and high school, for those of you who have kids and can actually feel already the sting of this pressure, coming very early, actually sometimes it starts you know, where even kids as they are coming out of elementary school, they actually now can take tests so that they can qualify for these summer programs at Harvard and Yale and other places where they can start preparing them. Every summer they start preparing them. And of course, uh, this is becoming very elitist as well because not everyone can actually go to these kinds of programs. So prep schools become very much the, the place where these things uh, are happening. Uh, but it has implications on our students and our kids themselves and how they conceive of the university. Um, it's about my individual achievement, not about my commitment to the social imperative. Um, I use this work of this Austrian philosopher Ivan Illich, who back in the 80s wrote a fantastic uh, essay that, that I recommend uh, called Silence is a Commons. Um, and he said, um, and he's not a Luddite, he's not someone who's anti-technology, he's just concerned about how technologies and different kinds of, of innovations are restricting our social experience. He said, computers are doing to communication what fences did to pastures and cars did to streets. <laughs> Um, and, and, and I think it, you know, it makes perfect sense. I'm just going to uh, read a little bit from his essay just to give you a sense of what this means. He says, Before, in any juridical system, most of the environment had been considered as commons from which most people could draw most of their sustenance without needing to take recourse to the market. After enclosure, the environment became primarily a resource at the service of enterprises, which by organizing wage labor transformed nature into the goods and services on which the satisfaction of basic needs by consumers depends. This transformation is in the blind spot of political economy. So he wants us to grapple with this fact that the problem is not whether computers are good or not. It's actually what they lead us to think uh, or, or replace us by making the logic of computers basically dictate the way in which we live our lives. And, and we can find examples uh, of that. So just like streets are no longer for people because they have become roadways strictly navigable by cars, universities as centers of education for all and as a commons runs the, uh, run the risk of being subsumed in that logic of markets and become vulnerable to the encroachment of greedy bottom line considerations. This is already happening as public education is furiously privatized. 
So how can we call our public universities public anymore, um, given the fact that this is uh, already happening? Um, look, this is, this is happening also in politics, right? And so think about the spectacularization of politics and think about the incursion of money in politics. And it's become so naturalized that even when we are completely revolted by it, we really don't seem to be able to do anything about it. Uh, we have one presidential candidate who has been raising quite a bit of concerns about this, obviously, Bernie Sanders. Um, and uh, he's laughed at as, oh yeah, he's so idealistic and his idealism is not going to get him anywhere. Uh, but he's the only one who's actually talking about these things. But it's become so naturalized that very few people, if they don't question it, they, or if they question it, they feel like they are completely... Uh, paralyzed. They can't do anything about it. We don't want the university system to actually get to that point where that is already happening and we can't do anything about it. So, examples of how this incursion of market ideology actually is penetrating the university. Here's the, this is an overview of state funding for high, higher education across the nation, right? And as you can see, higher education right here, right? And so, um, this is um, where it is in uh, 2014, right? And so as you can see, as other services and where the states are spending most of their money. So, you know, elementary and secondary education is getting uh, the biggest share, so that's, that's fine. But what's happening is that there, is, there has been a decline over the years. So this is since 2000, right? As it says here, Despite modest increases in 2013 and 2014, state support for public higher education per full-time uh, student remains nearly 30% below spending in 2000. Wow. Right? So as you can see, it goes all the way down, and then it picks up a little bit, it picks up again, and then, you know, we are now kind of picking up a bit, but as you can see, uh, particularly for Colorado, the situation is actually pretty disturbing. Revenue sources of public research universities, right? This is uh, 2001, 2006, and 2012. Look at state appropriations, right? They start here in 2001. Here is where they are in 2012. Federal and state local grants and contracts, obviously, they are going higher because, well, universities need this kind of money for research and, and, and for many other things. Private gifts and grants and contracts. As the money from the state is, uh, you know, is uh, getting drier and drier, obviously you're going to uh, require a lot more of these private gifts. And look at the tuition. Tuition is going much higher, right? So that's that prompts a lot of people to ask: Are public universities really public anymore? Because they are now driven by tuition a lot more than they used to be. And there are some public universities that are one better than other universities. Yes? I guess the only thing I would be interested in terms of what's missing here is what do scholarships look like? Have they gone up as a result? And um, where, where does that money come from? We're, we're going to get to that. Okay. Yeah. Because um, it's a really tricky situation. Sometimes mm -hmm. it does, but then scholarships are not necessarily just based on merit anymore. And I'll talk about that. Okay. Here is where it's depressing for Colorado. Colorado sits at the bottom. This color right here, 2,000 to 4,000. This is state support for public higher education for full-time equivalent student. Right? Um, we are in the company of Arizona, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. Right there. And why? Because of these, I, I put these in succession around different things, right? So here we're going to look at... Um, uh, uh, the state support. Colorado has reduced its support for higher education by nearly, you know, almost 70% between 1980 and, 20, uh, and 20, 2011. Mm -hmm. Biggest cut in the nation. Colorado appropriations to higher ed, ed will reach zero in 2019. South Carolina reduced, this is, this is the, it's the second, by 67, will reach zero in 2031. Arizona by 62, will reach zero in 2032. Let's talk about tuition. Tuition has increased by 247% at state flagship universities, by 230% at state universities and colleges since 1980. Tuition at CU Boulder, just to, to give us a sense of uh, uh, difference in time, 1980, about $700 in 2016, it's uh, 9,000 plus. Non-resident tuition from 1980 
about 3,000 2016 is 32,000 plus. Um, in 1960, tuition at UC Berkeley was free mm -hmm. for a California resident. Today, it costs 13,000 um, for tuition plus another 15,000 for room and board. Wow. All right. So this is. Uh, this is this is disturbing. This these are numbers that are dis disturbing, um, and you, you you could say, well, um, states are also in a bind; they cannot really afford to do that. But we need to reclaim that language. We need to be able to say our priorities should be in order. We cannot just say, oh well, if they don't have money, then that's you know, it's okay, that's fine. We'll just you know continue doing business as we are doing it right now, which is to go to private donors to give us more money. Student debt. As a result of, this, of these statistics, student debt estimated at $1.2 trillion now. Seven million debtors actually now are in default. The average student debt at college graduation in 2004 was about $18,000. In 2014, it's almost $29,000. That's about 56% jump. The student debt crisis is worse at states with the highest paid presidents. I thought that this was actually pretty interesting. <laughs> Right? Um, and I can give you the source of all of this information if you are interested in it, because um, the, the, these are not just numbers thrown out there uh, without any kind of uh, backup. 78.3% of faculty held tenure track or tenure position nationally in 1969. That number today is only 30%. Mm -hmm. right? And I think if you ask faculty today, they would concur. They, they know this because they've seen it happen in their lifetime. 70% of teaching faculty today are adjunct or graduate teaching assistant, right? Which is good to have, you know, a lot of graduate teaching assistant around and adjuncts, but these are also, particularly the adjuncts, some of them are teaching four courses uh, with very, very little pay, no they're overworked, benefits. no health benefits, <laughs> very precarious working situation. But this is, this is where, we, where we're heading, right? So, um, and the more you hire uh, presidents who are also business managers and business leaders, the more you end up with this kind of mentality um, of let's look at changing this ratio between tenure faculty and tenure track faculty and adjuncts and graduate students. Administrative positions grew by 60% between 1993 and 2009, 10 times the rate of growth of tenure faculty position. Well, of course, because now that you are operating as a business, you need administrators who are seasoned, who are very, um, you know, well trained in business, um, in order to be able to um, to pull it through. And of course, that requires bigger salaries. And uh, some people are arguing also that's why tuition is going up because universities have now to pay these very, very, um, you know, competitive um, uh, business leaders as well. Yes. This is a naive question, yeah. but. I'm assuming that administrative positions are not tenured. No. Well, um, or are they contracted? Or it, it depends. I mean, sometimes uh, uh, faculty would actually be tenured faculty, and then they'll move into an administrative position. But when they make that transition, obviously their salaries are going to go up, right? And sometimes universities do that so that they can keep a little bit the uh, salary uh, range as small as possible. But sometimes you don't have that kind of. Um, uh, the business skills within the right. college and university, right. so you have to hire someone else. Right. Yeah. 19 out of 40 presidents from the top 40 research universities sit, sit on at least one company board. Now, I can't really say what that really means, but we, we have an idea about sometimes so their loyalties can actually be also towards some, some kind of market considerations because they are sitting on you know, some board of Microsoft or board of Google or some something of that of that sort. And we have to uh, wrestle with that as well before we get to Scott Walker. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a system, systemic process of privatization of uh, public higher education, which has been in motion really since the 80s. Actually, some educators and some experts in, in, in the, uh, the, the education sector have been arguing that it actually goes even back if, uh, beyond 1980. You may remember Ronald Reagan's famous line, we don't, uh, states should not be subsidizing intellectual curiosity, right? <laughs> which uh, went on to really become his kind of signature politics around higher education. He slashed quite a bit, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars 
um, uh, of federal money to public universities. Um, so the university has become, as an article in The Atlantic has put it, an article that actually was part of a three uh, uh, series it just uh, finished yesterday in The Atlantic, called, uh, said that the, co the public university is becoming a marketplace comp comprised of a patchwork of rankers and consultants and test prep companies and how to beat the system guidebooks. Rankings are a key reason institutions compete to convince the best students and their parents to buy their product. Mm. So this market mentality of competition, rankings, prestige, and reputation are skewing our priorities and undermining the values that we uh, want to see in public universities, and they really skewed them in, in some despicable ways. Take merit aid. Here's to your question, right? Um, merit aid has risen dramatically in the past few years across the board, both in public universities and also in private universities. And they have reached these record numbers recently, um, but, in, but only independently of financial need. It's part of what some are calling the bidding wars. Top students are in high demand, and colleges often bid against each other to offer the most appealing package, regardless of their financial need. Mm. So this limits the uh, uh, lower income students' chances of getting access to college. In 2003, only 30% or 30% or of merit aid was given to students with family incomes in the top quartile. Okay, so uh, this is part of this competition. And ranking, the U.S. News and World Report, which is the most reliable uh, ranking, um, uh, um, you know, that, that actually a lot of students and parents would consult, is driving this kind of, of, of craziness as well. Um, uh, there's a, a report recently that says that a lot of universities, both public and private now, they monitor SAT scores and they see who is scoring really high and they target those students to uh, ask them to apply to their schools even they, if they know that they cannot really accept them but they want them to apply so that they can get to reject them because the, if you reject based on sort of a percentage you get closer to the Ivy League. Right? You know, Harvard um, uh, is able to accept only 4.5% of their applications, right? And so if you get closer to that, if you get to the 10%, then you get really close to that Ivy League, and then your ranking goes up in U.S. <laughs> News and World Report, right? So this is, this, is, this is what Illich was actually warning us again, right? Um, which is the market ideology, become, it dictates the way in which we do business also at the university. So here is um, Scott Walker, uh, who has led a vicious campaign against the tenure um, uh, system in the universe of the University of Wisconsin, um, and he wanted actually to change the mission statement of the University of Wisconsin system altogether. And what you could, what you see in purple is what he added, and obviously what is um, what is uh, you know uh, struck through is what he deleted. So the mission of the system is to develop human resources to meet the state's workforce needs. Here he actually invoked Reagan and he said states should not be in the business of subsidizing intellectual curiosity. So for him, it's just to meet the state's workforce uh, needs. Uh, he didn't like to extend knowledge and its uh, application beyond the boundaries of its campuses and to serve and stimulate society by developing, well, he didn't like that. Um, he took out this piece here, inherent in this broad mission are methods of instruction, research, extended training, and public service designed to educate people and improve the human condition. Basic to every purpose of the system is the search for truth. He didn't like that. And we can argue also about that because I could argue about, well, whose truth it is, and we can get into these very kind of, um, you know, uh, deep conversations about that. But it's interesting how invoking Reagan, he thinks that this is, um, this is not, this should not be the business of universities. Universities should not be expanding the intellectual horizons of their students. They should just give them skills and get them, um, you know, on their way to graduation. So the question becomes, how do we respond to this? How do we respond to this culture of attack? Um, and how do we restore the mission of the public university? Because some faculty are extremely demoralized and have lost faith in their administration. 
Others are simply not interested in addressing the current attacks on the university. Others are furious that the language of specialization and professionalization has trivialized their efforts to connect their work to a larger civic um, uh, mission and social problems. And some have become helplessly cynical. Uh, and their cynicism has become paralyzing, both to themselves, to the institutions where they work, and to their students. I don't believe in cynicism. I um, believe, as George Carlin said, scratch any cynic and you will find a disappointed idealist. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like this idealism, actually, to be an engine of change, of action, of forging ahead, of waging the force of language to counter this totalizing narrative of market fundamentalism, which is making a travesty of the public mission of our universities. As neoliberalism seeks to narrow the mission and the purpose of the public university through their tuition, uh, precarious working conditions, a technocratic mode of learning, we should stake out our own claim loudly and to everyone that the democratic values of the public university cannot be tempered with. And there are a lot of academics who actually have done this in books and I've done them in college, in uh, uh, journal uh, articles. But the problem is, only other disappointed faculty actually are able to see that and other students. And they're not really getting out there into the public to make this case to policymakers, to legislators, to the members of the public so that they understand precisely how they have and why they have to preserve that sanctity of the public university. We must go beyond simple moral outrage and critique to, cre to reclaim those values. You know, I'm, I'm an idealist, and again, as I said, my idealism is rooted in realism. I know that just speaking about this thing is not necessarily going uh, to make it happen. So the example that I'm bringing uh, today, um, and, and if you could, uh, Monica, if you could just uh, circulate that um, uh, brochure, is, um, I hope, is uh, uh, one of the ways in which we could um, start to recuperate that social and political edge of the public university as an, uh, an incubator and a catalyst, hopefully, of social change in which students, faculty, and the community work together in order to address and seek solutions to pressing social problems. We call it media and public engagement, right? And we deliberately wanted to put the idea of public in there. We thought, here is a public university that should actually offer something that has the public in it and uh, is able to belabor to students as well as to the rest of the community that this is the kind of things that the university should be in the business of doing. And that's one way of walking back, at least of trying to walk back this uh, steady march, as I said, of neoliberalism. So. Um, what is MAPE? Well, MAPE for us is a way of slowing down. We talked about social acceleration. We want to slow things down, right? Just like there is slow food and there is slow scholarship and there is mm -hmm. slow money. We want a slow university. Uh, but it, slow not necessarily meaning that it, a slow university that doesn't really um, optimize its relationship with the public. It's slow in the sense that slowing down the march of neoliberalism and of that logic of market ideology, which I said is um, uh, currently undermining the mission of the public university. So skills and technologies are very much at the heart of this program, but they are only tools. You think through uh, the, these tools, you think with these tools, but you are not making the tools as the ultimate goal of your training. Right? And sometimes those things get conflated. You know, it's like, I, I just need to learn how to use a camera. And parents themselves think that this is always my, my daughter going to become, you know, an anchor at uh, this and this, um, you know, uh, television station. Uh, and if th that's not the case, uh, she probably doesn't need a broadcast uh, major, um, you know, so maybe she should do business or something else. Um, those kind of considerations are very, very problematic. But again, if you... Uh, uh, put them together with the reality, the harsh reality, the economic reality that we are dealing with, it makes sense that parents are asking those kinds of questions. We need a return on our investment. But we ask also the parents to tone down these kinds of considerations so that their kids are not necessarily just thinking about tools and about, you know, about training and about this, this, this incredible obsession with jobs and skills. And they'll be all right. 
<laughs> you know, I think they will be all right because if they have the ability to think and the ability to be creative, and that's what the intellectual engagement of a university is there for, um, they are actually going to be able to um, find out ways for them to make a, a business out of what they're doing, either by uh, you know continuing with education or by finding jobs, or creating even jobs uh, that have not been created yet. So uh, MAPE is designed as a theme-based course um, that emphasizes a proper balance between media and theory um, and criticism and a sustained involvement in public life. So we believe that we want to go beyond these artificial boundaries between theory and practice. You know, people say, oh, either you go to the university for theory or you go to a vocational school and you get some training. We want to merge those two things and make sure that uh, your practice is actually informed by some critical thinking about the topics that you want to put together. So, um, MAPE is designed to become a model of how skills and media technologies are put in the service of intellectual engagement and social action. It, uh, it is meant to serve as an incubator, uh, a testing ground for this kind of socially minded work which six, seeks to attract students who are committed to a vision of the university, not as a knowledge factory, but as a trampoline into civic engagement and a life of, hopefully, of meaning. It's a program that seeks to reconcile the university of value with the university of values. The university of value being the kind of very uh, business-like uh, jobs and skills university, and the university of values, which is the university that I've been advocating for. This is how uh, you know Ghanaian uh, uh, philosopher Anthony Appiah actually has talked recently in a New York Times article about the what's the point of college, and he said. Uh, there are two colleges. There is a college of what he calls the, of, uh, the University of Utility, and then there is the, univers the University of Utopia. And he says the way in which we've talked about those two universities is separately. Now comes a time in which we have to think about how we, we merge them together. And that's the only way for us to recuperate again this, um, this edge of uh, the social edge of the public university. So we would like to make this program accessible to everyone. Now, if you come to this program, it costs money. It costs $30,000. So only a few people are going to be able to. We've, we've fought hard so that we get, we have a very supportive dean who was able to actually, um, and, and an associate dean of graduate studies as well, who've been able to leverage the administration so that we have some money, and we have some money to be able to subsidize a couple of students. We have seven students in the first year, and we've just accepted another wave of seven students, two of whom are going to get um, you know, some form of fellowship. But we need more, because the students now who are going to be paying $30,000 it pains me that these students, uh, you know, either have to take loans or have to, you know, borrow money from whoever in order to make this happen. How can we make sure that we can make this program, um, again, um, uh, uh, affordable is precisely one of the reasons why I'm doing these kinds of talks. And this program is part of CU then? Yes, it, yes. So, quick question before we get to the actual Q&A. Yeah. Why don't you consider MAPE outside the ambit of the University of Colorado? Well, <laughs> given all the yeah. financial baggage, et cetera, et cetera, administration, this, that, the other thing, you have something more affordable. It is, um, well, I work within the university, so if I create something outside of the university, that's going to be a very, you know, this yeah. This is all confidential here, except for the video, <laughs> video <laughs> camera. No, no, I'm not, I'm not necessarily concerned about how, you know, someone might see this uh, from um, the, the, uh, the administration of CU. I think that um, it's a valid question, right? It's a valid question, but I'm working from within a system, and I have to also try to uh, reform that system. And I don't want to just take this program outside and say, okay, well, here's the solution. Let's well, just I'll get just, outside. I'll just remember, all your observations you've made so far about the whole thing. Yeah. Kind of boil it down to, we've got, uh, Monica, is it? Yeah. Yes. With the MOOC, with the up right. program, uh -huh. right? I would think there's a tremendous possibility. <laughs> and I know it's more rhetorical than anything else. I'm yeah. I'm not going to actually use the system and, to get out of it, right? Yeah. But if your heart was really in making this something like MAPE available to many more students, why wouldn't you consider that? And I, I know the answer, you don't have to answer. Yeah, well... Yeah. Why you ask? No, because well, I'm making a rhetorical question. Well, sure, 
Let me explain. It's what it's not it's it's not a, it's not only about the uh, how delicate of a, of a of a of a question it, it might be right within within the college. For me, it's I I want to act from within the system, right. and I see this as one way of yeah. really making some noise within the system so that the system actually is able to reform itself. I might be an idealist. It's not going to happen overnight, but we need. Many of these efforts to be able to actually get to that point. Yes. Your, your project is probably a pilot pro uh, project also. That you oh, can, if it if it works, then you spread it out. Yeah, right. exactly. We want to make sure it works at home first. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And and we are and, and I'm not I'm not completely opposed to say private money or you know money that will come to us even from corporations. But I want to be actually in in control mm -hmm. to some extent of that as opposed to. Um, corporations that come in and they say, okay, we want you to produce an X number of graduates and we want you to actually educate them in this way so that you can prepare them for a project that we're working on. Um, this is the, the kind of, the video that I showed you earlier of uh, Griselda and, um, you know, the other student who worked on that project. Those, uh, when I saw that and I saw the, 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 the incredible zeal and passion that they had, and the fact that the university actually has contributed in one way or, or, or another to, to putting them on that, on that uh, track to raise consciousness about a topic that is not addressed by the media. And as you can see, the numbers are staggering. And it's a major problem. It's just, these, just so in yeah. an application, it's just, we're just crying out for a need for real investigative journalism in yes. this country. Right. For so many reasons, by their very nature, they're going after, let's say, special interests of this or that. So this is beautiful in terms yeah. of developing investigative journalism as a real respected kind of profession again. Absolutely. And it's not only investigative journalism, right? And so in the sense that this is innovative investigative journalism, right. in the sense that it really harnesses the power of the media moment that we have, mm -hmm. right? So you can think about... Um, not just, okay, I'm, I'm going to write an article for The Atlantic or for The New York Times. You, uh, you, you can actually even develop a transmedia project, right? You can develop an interactive installation and you can work with artists, which is really what this program actually does. That's where Monica comes in. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, and, and I think it's that, it's that community, right? So, and, and then students are working also with community leaders. They are working with activists. Uh, we have we have one student right now who is uh, doing her project, and she just uh, you know uh, is working on the final touches of her proposal. She's interested in um, refugees who have been uh, placed here in uh, as a, from a government program here in Colorado, who are actually victims of sexual abuse um, in war ravaged uh, you know uh, countries of Africa, and uh, this is a very delicate topic actually to talk about and then she spent quite a, a bit of time trying to gain the trust of this community so that she actually is able to showcase what they are going through you know anything to transition into a sort of American uh, life experience the challenges that they are facing um, and this is work that a journalist would have done right so sort of this is how journalists do their job should, properly should. but the way or should uh, but the way in which this is going to be shared with the public is going to be truly innovative because it's a different platform altogether so it's it's very interactive uh, it could actually involve video it could involve documentary form it could involve installation art and whatnot um, and we think that that's the that's what speaks to the heart of young people today is their ability to combine these things. I mean, they have a passion. They go and take uh, 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 nine credit hours uh, studying in depth this particular topic. Um, and so that could be actually in any department based on the topic that they've identified. And then they uh, immerse themselves in uh, practical uh, courses, right, around the art of filmmaking, if this is what they want to do, transmedia, and all of this is offered at the college. This is this pro program works well because it is housed in this College of Media, Communication, and Information. And it would appeal to the old people, too, not just young people. So, please, up for my Actually, question is, yeah. is there a way for somebody, a non-university student, paying for it, yeah. slash auditing or whatever, uh -huh. to participate in Absolutely, this? absolutely, absolutely. We have a student who is, um, I think, 67 years old, um, who just applied to the program. 
right? And she's been working, uh, she's of Mexican origin, she's been working a lot with immigrants in the Denver, um, you know, metro area. And she wants to take this to the next level. Her activism, she wants to take it to the next level. And she just applied and she will start in, in the fall. So, yes. I'll take that back. It's not only about you know young people, uh, but it's it's open to everyone who wants to really apply for it. Let me just uh, finish uh, uh, just my conclusion, and I'd, I'd be more than happy to uh, oops, um, to get some more questions and have a, a conversation about this. Um, so let me just say why I came today um, to talk to you. Um, as I said, I did not come simply to whine about the deplorable state of public <laughs> universities or uh, merely share with you my anxieties as a wounded academic who deeply cares about the ideals of the university and our commitment to students. I came here today to ask for your help, not just your empathy. That is, if you agree with me about, obviously, the risks that we are facing. A few years ago, Stanley Fish wrote a, uh, a couple of pieces uh, for the New York Times. Uh, he titled one, Aim Low, and the other one, Save the World on Your Own Time, in which he asked academics to limit themselves to teaching skills and disciplinary competence. Fish wrote about what uh, any academic actually should be doing, and he said, quote, researchers should not falsify their credentials or make things up or fudge the evidence or ignore data that tails against uh, preferred conclusions. Those who publish should acknowledge predecessors and contributors provide citations to their sources, and strive always to give an accurate account of the materials they present. That's it. There's nothing else, and nothing more. But this is no small list of professional obligations, and faculty members who are faithful to its imperatives will have little time to look around for causes and agendas to champion. Well, I don't want to aim low, and we should not be telling our students to aim low at a time when we need their vigilance and their critical thinking. Sure, we don't have an exclusive access to some kind of truth about everything. I think it would be pretentious of us to assume so. But we have an obligation to awaken the critical faculties of our students. As Edward Said, uh, uh, that I showed you earlier, reminds us, because if we don't aim higher in the age of Trump, Putin, ISIS, climate change, political corruption, racial tension, global poverty, and erosion of human rights, then as Stuart Hall warns us, not only our theory, but our conscious, conscience will have let us off the hook. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, now we can have a conversation if we have time. Absolutely, this is the fun part. <laughs> okay, good. That's very, very stimulating, my goodness. I've got a whole list of things I'm sure everybody else has, but you know, there's an impetus here to towards national decline. Yes. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Creativity, for God's sake. I mean, involvement in, um, in local and national politics. If you can't see through an argument using critical thinking, which is exactly what I'm doing right at the moment with state and federal officials, ah. if they can't understand yes. um, the sort of details we get into in a relaxed critical thinking scientific class, you know, death occurs, yes. despite it being 100%. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, goodness me. Um, even down to the level of Boulder and other university cities as successful beacons that draw entrepreneurs. Because yes. they like the creative life and so forth. If you start getting down to the technical school level, however you de describe it, mm -hmm. that's going to diminish that attractiveness to some extent. Yes. Maybe it's a, a minor factor, but it's just... No, actually, it's, uh, it's interesting that you raise that because one of the things that we're trying to do with the program is to involve um, entrepreneurs, um, either social entrepreneurs or uh, technology entrepreneurs, and particularly because in Boulder we have a very vibrant scene of people who don't subscribe also to the Silicon Valley type of um, development plan. Right? Some of these people actually uh, like more what they call the Silicon Alley uh, type of plan, right? so which is kind of more open, more egalitarian. And the person who is uh, helping us run the MATE program is someone who is um, now getting all kind of um, support and would need more support. 
to actually um, rethink the um, the ownership of the internet, right? And so he is uh, what he calls platform cooperativism, which means a cooperative look at how we can produce apps and how we could produce uh, different kinds of internet uh, companies that would service um, the the you know. Um, the social, basically, and the political in a way that are more egalitarian. Um, he's also a journalist, a very seasoned journalist. He was the the reporter who wrote that very um, first article about Occupy uh, movement um, um, in, in Harper's Magazine uh, about the birth of a movement. Um, and he is himself an activist, but he's also a journalist. And much of his life he spends really trying to think al along the lines of the boundaries between those two the, those two lines, and he's very open to entrepreneurs. He's o open to uh, you know uh, uh, tech managers, and has been able to leverage the tech scene here to uh, partner with us and uh, provide opportunities for our students for internships, but also our students probably hopefully to have jobs in some of these uh, places down the road. Yeah. Just a, a final point to yeah. illustrate for the non-academics in the audience that. Um, the emphasis on uh, grantsmanship, on forcing faculty, particularly in the sciences, yes. to go after federal grants to support the university as the state level is support is going down, then impinges, of course, very directly on teaching. You get somebody as as notable as Hunter Rawlings, you'll yes. probably know the name, yeah. decades ago, saying to new faculty. Forget about really putting your effort into teaching. Just do the minimal and get the money, get the money. Yeah. And it's an extraordinary process. I think that that's uh, absolutely uh, true, uh, not only uh, in the sciences, but also elsewhere, is that there is this pressure now on us. Um, you know, it used to be that chairs didn't really have to do this kind of work. Um, but now I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a silent rule that you have to go out there and then fund for these things. I mean, I happily do it, but I, I'm doing it only to convince myself that I'm not doing it as a reactionary move to what's happening. I'm doing it because I really wholeheartedly believe in the mission of this uh, program and also in the role of public universities. And if we don't do it, um, either someone else will, will fund these uh, programs and they'll do it basically as they please and we will have no say in that but you're absolutely right this has a tremendous impact on other responsibilities of, of faculty Final, um, when I uh, retired from the university the state support was five percent as I remember do you know what it is now it's uh, less than three percent good God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was 20%, I think, back in the 80s. And that's why it's headed to zero in Right, that's right, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Nabil, I was yeah. wondering about a um, statement that you had on the screen about one out of so many um, tenured faculty are sitting, or maybe it was chairs, are sitting on uh, company boards. Presidents. Presidents, presidents are sitting on company boards. Yeah. So I, when we look at the service part of tenure, um, for those of you in, not in academia, there's a, a portion of the tenure process where you're evaluated on a thing called service and how much service you can give back to the community. But that's my question, actually, is how do we understand service? Has that changed? So is sitting on a company board considered um, service? Well, it could. I mean, um, some people could claim that it does. Um, I mean, I was talking mostly about presidents there, right? There might be professors who do that as well, and I'm sure they will count that as part of their service. But I think for me, it's how you also change the parameters of what you call you, you consider as service, service and your community engagement. This program um, allows students, but also the faculty who are running it, to engage the community out there and to seek their help in running a program like this. So that kind of service to me is a lot more important. You bring the university to the community and you bring the community to the, to the university. Service sometimes for some faculty is, oh, I uh, reviewed a, a book manuscript for this uh, publishing, um, you know. Or I was uh, interviewed by or, Channel 4 News. That's right, or <laughs> I was interviewed by Channel 4 News. And that's fine. I mean, yeah. that's all uh, fine and, and I think it's great. Uh, but we need to, uh, I think, move to the next level. And some of us do these kinds of things, and, and uh, sometimes it's not quite taken into consideration, uh, as, and it doesn't have the same weight 
as same when you when you say that you have uh, reviewed uh, seven articles for uh, three journals mm -hmm. uh, in in one year or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that th there is still work uh, to be done. One of the exciting things about the new College of Media Communication and Information is that we are thinking about relaxing. Well, relaxing probably is not the right word uh, of uh, modifying the parameters both of um, you know of tenure in general actually about your scholarship what counts as scholarship what counts mm. as creative work what counts as your kind of teaching engagement and certainly what count, counts as your That's service nice. mm. as well and hopefully this would be a trailblazer in 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 the in the field uh, at least for us in our field mm -hmm. respective fields of journalism pr and advertising uh, communication uh, uh, media studies, critical media practices, um, and then um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some info, info science, information science, which is our new department, and then a graduate program in intermedia art um, as well. So that's where hopefully the next step mm. will be. I yes. have to run, but yeah. it was a pleasure. Thank and you. Best of success with this program. It Thank you so much. So exciting. If you could spread the word to as many people as possible, we'd be very grateful. Well, it's interesting because I think the the word there's there's almost a bigger umbrella, and that's the new college that you've created. That I think also is not very well known, and so yeah. I think you've got a, a dual task, not yes. just with this program, right. but with the actual college that exists. Yes, absolutely. Because it's probably the most sort of, sort of current college in the university. Mm -hmm. Yes, the and first one in more than 53 years. Yeah, and, and, really and well. I, think, yeah. I think that that's part of the message, and then this mm -hmm. special program within it, with the outreach and the kind of um, duality between critical thinking and actual practicality. Is, is very important, but I think there is an overarching message that is also important. I agree. Thank you for that. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks for thank coming today. You, thank you very much. I, I, I'll be in touch. I'm, okay. I'm sure I'll see you again. All right. Thank you. Well, this was good. <laughs> yeah, we live in times of change. Uh, the way I see it, universities are not going to be the way we think of them in 50 years. They're completely, the, the president of the University of Colorado says the only reason we're a state university is because of the original land grant. If it wasn't because of that, they, we, we would just be out of here because the restrictions on it is not worth the 3%. So that is a change. Two, kids used to go to college to hear different points of view. Now, you know, every university is liberal, anti-Semitic, anti-Islam, this, that, the other. So, so all of a sudden, it's not a safe place to go and expand your mind. Like if you're gonna drop acid or do drugs, you need a safe environment to experiment. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna open your mind when you go to college, it needs to be safe, and it's not. If you touch a girl, you could be accused of something if you do this. So, so the combination of money, the fact that, uh, that original liberal is not working, and the internet. You know, why go to college? They could just take lessons on course. So it basically tells me, I offered my son, who just graduated um, four years ago, $100,000 if he wouldn't go to college. And he spent a couple of weeks thinking about it and came back and says, you know, I want that um, social experience. Mm. You're right. Mm. I can learn more working for somebody or do this, that, yeah, I just want to go out and have four years of a vacation, right. dating, and right. what have you. You go, wow, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, change is coming. And I think change is, is not bad. No. You know? It's like I don't really think about it that way. And I certainly do not think that the public university in this way that I kind of dreaming about it is a perfect place. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. You know, well, I I think there because of the viciousness of the language against it, mm -hmm. You have to adopt also a language that is very, uh, you know, kind of provocative in order to, to take it back and then reach some kind of balance. You're absolutely right. I mean, there are certain things that you can't say in, in, in classrooms, as you said earlier, because some faculty will make fun of you. Or, or the faculty or, can't say it. You know, the right. faculty are not supposed to be warning that yeah. there will right. be the war rape or right. the war something. So right. Who the hell, That's right. you know, we took courses from faculty who were just radicals and mm. we wanted to be like them and now right. the faculty yeah. are not. Um, 